of the third day of this Eismar. And this is the session of rendering. And we have five papers of this in this session. So on the, the first of all, I would like to have, uh, I have some uh, announcement for attendees. And the first of all, uh, there are individual Discord channel for this session, as well as each paper for discussion with authors during week and beyond. So please use the Discord if you want to discuss with the author after or during this, this conference. And uh, this is a remind, uh, this, this is an element for viewers on YouTube. You can also register to join the interactive element of Isma 2021. And uh, uh, this is an announcement for all attendees. And uh, please go to the gather town after this session to talk with the authors one by one uh, in QA room. And this is a track A. So uh, please go to the uh, QA room of track A. The link to gather town is provided, by, provided in this code. Okay, so let's start the session. And each author will have 20 minutes for presentation. And the first paper is, sorry, wait a second. Deconstructing reflection maps using a stack CNN for mixed reality rendering. That is given by Andre Chalmers, Jan Hong Zhao, Dani, Daniel Modarios, and uh, Tehen Lee. Uh, Tehen Lee. And the presenter is Andrew. And Andrew Chalmers is a postdoctoral researcher at the Competition Media Invitation Center, CMIC, in Wellington, New Zealand. And he, his interests are a combination of global illumination and computer vision. He's a co founder of Wellington based startup Dream Flux. And uh, previously, he has taught computer graphics and computer science courses at Victoria University of Wellington. And uh, he has been created in feature film for his research with Beta Digital. Beta Digital. So, Andrew, if you're ready, please start your presentation. Thank you. I'll just get set up. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Chalmers. I'm a postdoc at the Computational Media Innovation Centre, or CIMIC for short, at Victoria University of Wellington. Today I'll be talking about our TV CG, CG paper titled Reconstructing Reflection Maps Using a Stack CNN for Mixed Reality Rendering. The focus of this paper is about solving the problem of seamlessly blending digital content into the real world. This is important in many application areas. For example, this would help realise the concept pitched in the original trailer for Pokemon Go but the actual experience looks like a Pokemon overlaid in the environment, whereas the concept showed the Pokemon existing within the environment with high quality shadows or highlights that match the background photograph. Remote communication is another area where relighting people to match the environment would significantly enhance the believability that a visitor actually teleported and existed within your environment. So imagine using your phone as you would in a typical AR application. You could also have a 360 degree camera on site next to you which would provide the surrounding lighting information to then allow you to light virtual objects to match the background photograph. Uh, but in many augmented and mixed reality applications, you don't have access to a 360 degree camera and therefore the surrounding lighting information is not available. Prior work has attempted to address this. As mentioned, there's a 360 camera on the left here. An alternative is the light probe, which is a physical mirror ball that you have inside your scene. And when you take a photo of it, it reveals the information outside of the field of view of the photograph. Again, this is just inconvenient to have on you. Alternatively, prior work has also attempted to estimate this information from a photograph. There's two ways of doing this. On the left, scene-based, and on the right, object-based. Object-based ways are similar to the chrome ball in which you have a specific object in your scene which you use to then estimate lighting out, outside the photograph. It generalizes the chrome ball to more abstract objects. Scene-based ways um, don't assume any particular object, but instead take the entire photograph as input to their model. Uh, the model then attempts to estimate the environmental lighting from that entire photograph. Uh, our method is based in this category of work, scene-based methods. However, the prior work is focused on estimating the light source directly, which they then use in the rendering pipeline for different materials. 
as you can see in this photograph, different objects exhibiting different materials, such as the matte paint on the background wall, the gloss jar, and the mirror-like reflection in the tabletop. Instead of estimating the light, we estimate the light convolved with the material directly. These are called reflection maps with, a, with varying roughness. Low roughness means like a mirror-like surface. Going up in roughness provides glossier materials, and then uh, the highest roughness is closer to diffuse. To summarize, we are able to estimate HDR environmental lighting from a regular limited field of view image. We are also able to ref estimate reflection maps and do so by proposing a progressively trained stack CNN structure. Each CNN in the stack can be directly used for rendering virtual objects with the corresponding roughness value. We evaluate our method on both indoor and outdoor scenes. To begin, we use a pretty standard CNN setup where the input to the CNN is going to be a regular photograph we're aiming to predict the light from, and the output is going to be the HDR environment map, uh, which contains all the lighting information. Um, note that we use the term RM here as the output, which is going to um, stand for a reflection map. Uh, so this is the standard way uh, that prior work have kind of done it, and we implemented this method. Uh, and we're going to improve upon this. Uh, firstly, uh, we need to do data preparation and then also improve the uh, learning methodology using uh, stacked structure. To prepare our data, we first consider outdoor and indoor cases separately. This is due to the fact that outdoor cases have parallel lighting from the sun and indoor cases have uh, spatially varying lighting. We then augment this data set the outdoor case is based on the 360 data set, Sun 360 data set, which is low dynamic range, so we inverse term map that one. And the indoor case is uh, spatially warped to account for the spatial variation in interior uh, lighting. We then extract the photo from the uh, environment map, and we do this for both scene types, and we pair that extracted photo with the augmented uh, panorama, and that's your um, input output pair for the network. We can then use that data to then train our network and the result is that we can take a new photograph and input that into the CNN, which then uh, estimates the uh, low roughness radiance map. And then we can use that radiance map through the typical rendering engine to render different materials, such as this teapot. We improve upon this basic setup by introducing a progressive training scheme and use the idea of curriculum learning. Uh, Curriculum learning is the idea of training your model using easy examples first and then gradually introducing harder and harder examples. You can consider the mirror-like uh, radiance map to be the hard case, whereas the diffuse map as the easy case. And we gradually go through all the roughness levels from high roughness down to low, training our network in this order. To prepare our data for uh, this new progressive training scheme, uh, we generate input-output pairs of photographs and a corresponding reflection map at different roughness levels. So we have a set of um, crops uh, and have a paired reflection map at a certain roughness level. We do this for both uh, indoor and outdoor scenes. Um, we have a discrete set of uh, rough, uh, reflection maps. So we start from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way to um, 1.0. To train progressively, we require a material model that has a roughness parameter. Various models can be considered for this task, and we went with the Fong model. Uh, it has a, a specular exponent here, k, and given this, uh, the roughness parameter uh, bound between 0 and 1, uh, this controls that specular exponent. So you can produce these reflection maps going from the mirror all the way to diffuse. Note that this is a property of the Fong model specifically, where when roughness is equal to 1, it does produce the Lambertian diffuse map, and then it continuously moves through the glossy levels, which is not the same as other material models, so it's quite elegant in this regard. And for the, and once we've got the data prepared and we've generated um, all the different reflection maps using the Fong model, we first train the lower roughness CNN um, uh, on the diffuse uh, 1.0 roughness um, reflection map. And then after it's converged, we transfer the weights of that CNN to the next CNN in the stack, which then targets a lower roughness uh, reflection map. 
we keep doing this um, progressively until we have trained a CNN uh, which can predict mirror-like roughnesses. Uh, this pro uh, progressive screen, uh, training scheme allows the network to have a good initialization uh, to better improve its ability to predict low roughness CNNs. Uh, the end result is a progressively trained stack CNN structure. Uh, this is a set of independent CNNs where each layer in the stack is a CNN that is able to target and predict a reflection map with a specific roughness level. Not only have we improved the prediction accuracy through this progressive training scheme, but we can actually use these trained models in isolation. For example, if we want to render a diffuse bunny, we can use the diffuse CNN directly rather than using the mirror-like CNN and mathematically convolving it down to diffuse. Uh, this operation of mathematically convolving is expensive in itself. This other benefit is that uh, since our CNN is trained specifically for diffuse, um, it can better predict the quality, quality of the diffuse map. Um, so this is the best possible diffuse result you can get, as opposed from convolving down from the mirror-like CNN. We evaluated our stack CNN in a couple of different ways. Uh, one was looking at the comparison between the stack CNN and using each layer in the stack for rendering compared to using the roughness equals zero layer only and then mathematically convolving to the different roughness levels. This is an example interface where users uh, had two teapots in front of them and they one was a ground truth lit one at a different uh, specific roughness level and then they would change the roughness of the estimated one to match it and then they would answer questions regarding its quality. Uh, so the first three questions, so this is indoor, this is outdoor, the first three questions are about its quality and we can see our stack CNN did better quality. Um, this is regarding you know light direction and color um, and roughness. And then the th fourth question was regarding how well the smooth, uh, how smooth the slider felt for roughness. Um, and so you can consider the blue one to be kind of a ground truth since it's mathematically con convolving and ours did fairly well to match that. Here's your evaluation using metrics. And this is against um, the state of the art as well as the mathematically convolving method. Uh, you can see uh, the lowest line there here, that light blue line, is using our progressively trained CNN as well as um, each layer in the stack directly um, for different roughness levels. And uh, you can see we did this on different metrics, including the ambient color, dir the directions of light, and then the dynamic range. And in all cases, our method was um, uh, improved uh, compared to the previous work. This is the same thing for Outdoor, again, our method is improving uh, over the previous work and using uh, each layer in the stack also showed the um, lowest error as well. Here are some examples where we compared our method against uh, our prior state of the art for um, outdoor scenes. Um, and we show on three different roughness, uh, on five different roughness levels. So here's our input photo, this is the ground truth, this is our estimate, and this is a prior work. You can see our light direction is much more accurate and has better contrast, and as well as the textual detail. Here's another example of an outdoor scene. And here's another example. And here are some indoor results. You can note the overall tone, detail, and light direction. Another example, and one more example with the blue light to the right, ours matched that quite nicely, whereas the prior work had issues with contrast. So to conclude, we propose a new stack CNN structure, which is progressively trained, and each layer in the stack is a CNN that targets a very specific material. Uh, future work could look at investigating stack CNNs which enforce continuity between the roughness levels. Uh, we could also investigate different material, uh, different material models, and we could also look at robustness to different camera sensors and environments. And on this point, I would encourage you to check out our next paper uh, titled Adaptive Light Estimation Using Dynamic Filtering for Diverse Lighting Conditions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrew, for a great talk. Uh, so first of all, is there any question or comment from audience? So if the audience, if you want to ask some questions, you can use the QA window of Doom 
or chat window so that we can pick up some questions. And uh, also you can use the writing, you can, uh, you can write a comment to the Discord. And uh, if you want to communicate with uh, also directly, please push the ray, ray hand button and uh, I can give you the permission to communicate with using your microphone. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to ask about the uh, data set. I'm curious about the data set that you uh, generate. So could you make uh, them introduce more detail, especially about for data augmentation? What kind of data augmentation did you apply? Uh, so the data set um, was the Laval data set for the indoor case. Um, mm -hmm. And we followed the authors of that data set. We followed their method for the augmentation of spatially warping it. Um, so that was an operation that warps the panorama in a direction. Um, so it moves the lighting around. Um, and then for the Sun 360 data set, this is a, an older, older data, data set, but it's quite large. And we didn't find too many. There are some coming out of um, outdoor data sets. Um, but this was a very large low dynamic range one. So we used uh, another prior work that focused on, uh, it was a deep learning method on LDR to HDR transfer. So we applied that method to that data set to then get high dynamic range outdoor lighting. Okay, thank you. So do you have any idea to provide an augmented data set to public? Uh, so for, Ideally, the I mean, there's lots of different data sets coming out. I think uh, the ideal case is probably a synthetic data set that's photorealistic um, mm -hmm. that we can generate. And I've seen some come out. The, there's one by Apple recently, HyperSim, that might be interesting um, that people could check out. Uh, but um, we could we can also provide the references for how we did it as well, um, which the uh, implementation and models are available online, so I, I can point people to them as well. Okay, thank you. So uh, here's a comment, a uh, question from Zoom. Uh, perhaps I may miss some part. I'm curious at the shadow processing of the virtual object. For example, the virtual object have an even surface. How this is handled? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, so that's, uh, we have two different implementations for that, uh, but they handled in traditional ways. We didn't do anything special for them. For the papers, uh, for the figures in the paper, they'll be using PBRT uh, to render the shadows uh, using, you know, a path tracer. And then we have an app as well that's actually live and we can provide links to like a live augmented reality app, but computing shadows is quite expensive. So in the app version, uh, we use shadow mapping um, for that. So we use the um, lowest roughness CNN to figure out where the light directions are, the primary light directions, to then inform the shadow mapping um, technique on where the directions of the shadow should be. Okay. Is there any other question or comment? No? So let's move to the next presenter. Thank you, Andrew. No problem. So next, okay. So next is uh, adaptive light estimation using dynamic filtering for diverse lighting conditions. And uh, this paper is given by Jia Hong Zhou, Andrew Chalmas, and uh, Tai Hen Li. And the presenter is Jia Hong Zhou. Jia Hong is a postdoctoral researcher in the Computational Media Innovation Center, CMIC, at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Her research interest includes machine learning and augmented reality. Jiahong, if, if you are ready, please start your presentation. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, can you see my screen now? So, yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going to yeah, start my uh, presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jiahong Zhao. I'm also from the Computational Media Innovation Center at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, all good to see you here. So today I'm going to talk about our paper, Adaptive Light Estimation Use Dynamic Filtering uh, for Diverse Lighting Conditions. So this work is, I mean, uh, this work was done uh, by me and my uh, colleague, Andrew Chalmers and Tyrion Ray. 
So this work is aiming to improve the reconstruction of the environment uh, lighting uh, in its reality uh, based on the partial field images. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, lighting A is one key component to simulate blends the virtual objects into the photograph for augment and miss reality. A render of a desk that is too bright or too dark uh, will be a, a, a pair thick. So to present high uh, fidelity illuminations for 3D objects renderings, mm -hmm. a, three, uh, a high dynamic range 360 environment map, map lighting is required. So uh, uh, omnidirectional capturing device can be used to obtain such uh, panoramic uh, environment map. But such setups are very expensive and need massive post-processing uh, techniques to uh, make it work. So an alternative way is to just use a, a mobile uh, a camera uh, that captures li limited field of your images uh, and just re reconstruct the global uh, environment lightings uh, based on the field of views, uh, uh, based on the uh, lighting views that it can uh, provide, like the, uh, the specular highlights, uh, the shade directions, and so on. Uh, so uh, with the uh, uh, rapid uh, development of the machine learning, uh, so this will become more and more competitive. So this paper we will focus on the uh, machine learning based inverse uh, lighting uh, topics. Uh, so uh, the reconstruction uh, from the uh, the reconstruction of the high dynamic range uh, even map from the low dynamic range. Uh, field of view image is a challenging problem considering the diversity uh, lighting can conditions that can be captured by mobile phones. So first of all, the uh, field of uh, view of uh, the mobile phones is very uh, limited and it, it only can uh, occupy less than uh, six persons, uh, six persons of the uh, of the panoramic scene. So that means that most of the uh, illumination uh, cues need uh, is invisible and need to uh, make the visual reasoning. So moreover, uh, there are lots of uh, lighting variations in the real world, especially uh, for the indoor cases. Uh, indoor cases, the, the, light, uh, the lighting uh, in different locations can vary a lot. Furthermore, considering uh, the wide range uh, sensor or the sense uh, characteristics of the capturing device, the capture uh, luminaries can have varying field of view, exposure, and color shapes. So all these uh, input variations require uh, the inverse. Uh, the inverse lighting must be uh, selective to uh, lighting uh, specific features and robust to the environment and the sensor uh, factors. Some recent methods uh, use uh, use deep learning framework to estimate the indoor lighting from the photographs and has tried to uh, address different sub problems within this field. So the seminal work uh, was uh, Gartner uh, seven, uh, 2017 worked on the indoor lighting estimation uh, used a deep CN network. Some follow-up uh, follow work uh, like uh, Garen uh, 2019, Mirror Illuminations and Lighthouse, they focus on the spatial wiring indoor lighting estimations, which uh, makes the estimated lighting become spatial wire in the indoor scene. Uh, some other work focus on the mobile applications, particularly. The most uh, presentative work is uh, Le Ledron uh, 2019, uh, which realized a real-time lighting estimation on a mobile phone uh, for uh, both indoor and outdoor cases. Although many neural network structure has been proposed to address different problems of the lighting estimation, Special consideration hasn't been given to the wide range of the lighting vibrations that from the camera response. As a re result, they are not robust to the variations of different mobile phones. So in this paper, we propose a novel dynamic lighting uh, network that we call DL9 uh, to address this problem. DL9 can estimate the high dynamic range indoor environment lighting from the photographs with the diverse variations. Specularly, uh, specifically, it supports high variations in the field of view, exposure, and white balance of the mobile cameras. So our key idea is to build and train a new deep neural network that is aware of the lighting variations of the input photographs. To achieve this, we introduce a spherical dynamic filtering framework that uh, adaptively generates the convolution filters for each input paragraphs. 
as opposed to the traditional framework uh, where the filters are fixed after the training and shared among all samples. We have a backbone network with an encoder decoder structure, and we'll apply such spherical dynamic filters framework on top of it as a composition. Specifically, we impose a novel multi scale dynamic modules onto the future uh, extraction layer, uh, and we'll impose a, a spherical uh, multi scale dynamic modules onto multi layers of the decoder. The dynamic features that extract from dynamic convolutions are more selective for the lighting specific use and can improve the generalization of the lighting estimation. So the aim of the uh, SMB module uh, is to model the uh, discrepancy uh, between the shared and the intercustomer mass lighting features that dynamically condition on each input symbols. So it consists in uh, two parts, uh, the dynamic the dynamic filter generator and dynamic convolutional layer. So in, uh, in the dynamic filter generator, uh, the general feature map uh, that is extracted from the backbone network are used as input and will be transformed to the input customized dynamic filters. In the training process, the filter generator will learn how to generate these filters rather than directly learn the filter parameters themselves. The learned uh, dynamic filters will conform with a general feature map uh, in the dynamic, uh, dynamic convolutional layer to generate the refined input customized feature map. And then will be combined with a general feature maps uh, as a final feature maps. So we use large data sets as our uh, training data set and use the MSE loss to supervise the training process. We create the data augmentation by considering the wild lighting variations brought by camera sensor, including uh, the color temperature, the exposure, and the field of view. For field of view augmentation, we choose the range between 70 to 120. They are the most common field of views on popular mobile device. For white balance uh, augmentation, we use white balance emulator, which is a deep learning based uh, color augmentation methods that proposed by RPV uh, 2019. The advantage of this method is it can accurately emulate a realistic color consistency, uh, color consistency degradation. So uh, for each portal, uh, we adjust the intensity scalar from 0.22 to 2.22. We conduct a pairwise comparison user study to evaluate how well our lighting estimation results. Users were presented uh, pairs of images that are containing uh, virtual objects illuminated by the environment map produced by our methods and one of the other methods. Using the ground truth as a reference, users were asked to select which image had virtual objects that is most similar to the reference. From the response ratios, we can see that the majority of participants pre preferred our methods over prior work across all variations on field of view, exposure, and color temperature. This indicates that the uh, DLNet can generate more realistic render results than other methods. We use two metrics to measure the important properties of the environment lighting in our evaluations. They are directional lighting error and tonal lighting error. The directional lighting error uh, measures the angular error between the nearest pairs of lights that between the ground truth and the estimates. The tonal lighting error measures the distance between the mean of the environment map uh, in LIB color space. So in our ablation study, we invested the contribution of using data annotation as well as SMG module against the baseline network that we saw the end of them. So the result shows that uh, the data augmentation will improve the baseline performance across all variations. And the combination of data mutation and as SMG outperform both the data mutation only map model and the baseline module. The improvement can be seen in the evaluations of uh, using both metrics. So uh, in our uh, so here is uh, here is our uh, one uh, comparisons with other uh, methods. So in these comparisons. Uh, we composite a mirror sphere and a glossy white sphere, uh, white sphere uh, into a, a paragraph. The predicted environment map by different methods are used to, uh, to illuminate the spheres. We can see uh, that 
uh, our radiant environment map match the ground truth better and can get a more convincing uh, render results. So here is an example of our lighting estimation uh, running uh, on the uh, continuous variations of the color temperature and exposure. We can see that our lighting predictions can maintain a good lighting consistencies across these different changes. Uh, here we show some, uh, some more render results and different variations. We can uh, see uh, that uh, compared with the uh, ground truth, our model can generate robust lighting estimation across different variations than other works. Than other works. So here we demonstrate some mobile applications uh, to show uh, some results of, of, of methods that are running on the image from the web. We can see that the virtual uh, computer looks real when light uh, using our predicted environment map. So here we show uh, some more AR examples. In this examples, we test with three different phones with different field of views. As we can uh, see uh, that the lighting estimation that can adapt to the changes of field of views and can maintain the lighting estimation across these different phones. Here is an AR example and uh, is poser of variations. Uh, we can see uh, that the shadows of the ball are maintained accurate across different uh, exposure levels. Uh, here is another AR example uh, under different color shift variations. Uh, we can uh, observe that the lighting estimation is robust and can maintain the lighting directions very well. So to conclude, we have present DLNet and a data annotation strategy that is able to accommodate the wide lighting variations of photographs caused by the environment and the uh, capture sensor. As a future work, we plan to improve the uh, loss functions for the model training uh, to get a more accurate lighting predictions results. And we also consider to improve the spatial and temporal consistency of the lighting predictions to make the model to be better uh, on the video input. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, from audience, are there any questions or comments? If you have, please write down the question or comment in the Zoom chat or QA window so that we can pick up. And uh, okay, so first uh, I would like to ask about, uh, yeah, I'm curious about the, your mobile application, mobile mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the change in visuality caused by camera operations such as uh, exposure or zoom adjustment, and mm -hmm. the change in visibility caused by environmental, environmental changes, such as changing change lighting or movement of object toward to, if the camera is moving toward to the object. So, so the same, same, diff, same uh, so two kind of visible, visibility changes is occurred at the same time. So mm -hmm. is it possible to handle such kind of uh, situation? Uh, yeah, yes, I think I think the uh, adaptive uh, dynamic uh, filtering framework will work well work on such uh, conditions. So actually, it, it didn't separate the uh, where the variations comes from, uh, but it can uh, use uh, uh, neural network setups with uh, dynamic filtering. Uh, it can uh, capture uh, the customized uh, convolution filters for each input in the testing process. So yeah, so I think uh, any uh, variations that happen in the input paragraphs, it can uh, at least capture some useful uh, uh, customized uh, features uh, that can, uh, yeah, can to, uh, improve the lighting estimation. Okay, thank you. So, uh, are there any other comments from audience? Mm, no. 
exercise. If you don't have any question clearly, it's a good idea to discuss with the speaker in the gather time. So, Johon, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move to the third presentation, neural cameras. Learning camera characters for coherent mixed reality rendering. It is given by David Mandel, Peter Moore, Tobias Langold, uh, Christoph Ember, Cho Hemori, Stephanie Dolman, Peter M. Ross, and Dennis Kalkofen. And the presenter is uh, David. David Mandel is a PhD student of the Institute of Computer Graphics and Vision at Glass University of Technology. His research interests include method for visual coherence in mixed reality. So David, if you're ready, please start your presentation. Yes. Good. Uh, hello, my name is David, and I welcome you to my talk about neural cameras, learning camera characteristics for mixed reality Visual coherence in mixed reality is a very difficult problem. There's a lot of things you need to actually make a visual content coherent with your real environment. So what is actually needed uh, to achieve this? You need geometry of your virtual ob objects. You need registration. That is, you need to register the virtual camera with your real one. You need material of your objects. That is the surface properties of the 3D geometry. You need proper light and uh, shadows so that the virtual object is looking coherent with the real environmental lighting. And you need camera effects. That is, if you have a video see-through device, you also need uh, camera effects applied to your virtual rendering to make it look like as if it would be captured by the same camera. Now, um, if you do not consider camera effects, there are many problems you may observe. For example, if you do not consider any lens effects your camera has, then you would maybe see something like this. So here there's a real tiger on the left, which is blurred because the camera is focusing somewhere else. And on the right, you can see a virtual tiger that is perfectly sharp because the lens effect is not considered. Then for example, if you do not consider any um, exposure or ISO values of your camera, then your virtual scene will maybe look too bright or too dark. So here you can see, for example, this virtual sheep, they look, too bright because uh, the exposure of the camera is not considered. And for example, they can have wrong colors, as you can see here. So here's a, a real horse on the left, and there's a virtual horse on the right. As you see, the colors are not matching up. That is because you do not consider any uh, color balancing effect um, that your camera is doing, for example, auto white balancing. Now, to simulate these effects, there are a lot of uh, parameters you need. And these are often unknown uh, for a camera. And there's a lot of fine tuning required to actually get the, all the necessary parameters to achieve these effects. Now, in our work, um, we only use images from the camera to infer all the necessary parameters to apply the camera effects. And the good thing about this is you can apply this basically to every camera because you can take images with every camera. Yeah, and here you see, for example, um, so if you would just render your 3D object, then the colors maybe look wrong. But with our system, you can come very close to the actual visual appearance of the real object. Now, our system consists of three major parts. So the three major parts of each camera are the lens, the sensor, and the so-called image signal processor. And what we do is we capture a, a real image and additionally we render a virtual scene where the camera is registered to the real camera. This virtual scene is uh, rendered using a sweet model and this will create our initial rendering for our system, so the input to our system. Then first we uh, add lens effects by using a neural network that is called LensNet. Second we add uh, effects that come from the camera sensor, so this is an uh, additional network sensor net. And then lastly, we have the so-called ISP net, which simulates um, effects that come from the image signal processor. So we arrive at the final image that we augment over our real um, scene to make it look visually coherent with the real camera image. Now let's first have a look at the uh, lens effects. So as I said, um, 
the most prominent effect for lens is probably out of focus blur. So here you see an example of this. This here, the tiger is perfectly sharp. That is because the camera is focusing onto the tiger and the rest of the scene here in the back is blurred because it's out of focus. Now, um, we introduce the lens net that is a multi-layer perception network that takes as an input the depth and the focus distance per pixel and outputs uh, parameters for a Gaussian mixture model. This Gaussian mixture model we then use to blur um, the sharp image using a depth of field uh, renderer. And to train this network, we take pictures with the camera with varying uh, depths and focus distances of a target. And we blur sharp images of this target with our system and then compare those to compute the loss for our network. Now here are uh, results of this part. So here you see the same image as before with the sharp tiger, which looks out of place. If we now apply the, the lens net to this uh, sharp image, we can actually achieve a coherent blur of the virtual tiger as well. Additionally, to evaluate our system, uh, we also try to apply the synthetic blur to um, real images. So here um, you can see the camera is focusing on the back. So the tiger in front is blurred. And on the bottom, you see the camera is focusing on the front. So the tiger in the back is blurred. Now, if you would just uh, render the images on top, you will see the same as before. So the tiger is perfectly sharp, but it should be blurred. Now, if we apply the system here, uh, we can achieve a very nice visual coherent blur as well. And we can get a pretty nice PSNR um, to the real uh, image of above 30. Now we also compare uh, the system to um, a Gaussian mixture model that has been estimated using an expectation maximization algorithm. And here you can see that the, the error is already much um, lower. And we also compare it with a so-called depth dependent convolution um, that is the usual way you render a depth of field effect in real-time computer graphics. And here you see the result is the, the worst, basically. Now the next step in our system is the so-called sensor, sensor net. Um, so here what we do is we take the RGB values from the previous step. And additionally, we also uh, use the ISO and exposure value of the camera. And the output are the raw RGB values of the sensor. Yeah. And additionally, we also try to um, simulate the noise that comes from the sensor. So the camera sensor introduces a lot of noise from different sources. And um, we add this sensor to the input of our network. So we can apply noise as well. To train this network, we use um, colors of a known image target. So here we have a color target. And we take several images at varying ISO values and exposure and also different lighting conditions. Um, to train this network with it. So now let's uh, see some results of this step. So here you see uh, these color patches of the color target. If you would just overlay uh, the colors without doing anything, um, you clearly see that the colors are wrong. If you now apply the network um, to this, you see that the colors are already matching up very nicely. But if uh, there's a lot of noise, so if you have a high ISO value, for example, in a dark room, you need a high ISO value to get a good image then you will see still um, the rendered patches in the middle because there's a lot of noise. If you apply now on noise module as well, we can not distinguish it anymore because the noise is applied as well. The last step of our system is the so-called image signal processor. Now here we adapt a previous work of Gao et al, um, which uh, who applies a network that is called the raw to JPEG network which uh, trains the transformation from raw to JPEG images. So raw images are the images um, that the camera sensor um, basically uh, outputs. And the JPEG images are after the image signal processor has done his pre-processing step. Um, and here what we do is we take the result of SensorNet and run it through um, a raw to JPEG networks. So it actually consists of two CNNs, one that trains the transformation from raw to YOV, and the other trains it from YOV to raw. And we put the virtual uh, image through the raw to YOV to get the final output. Additionally, we extract a feature vector um, from the YOV to raw conversion by using the camera image to get a global color transformation from raw to YOV space. 
And we train this network using raw and JPEG image pairs uh, taken with the camera at many different uh, scenes and lighting conditions. So here's a result of this uh, last part. Here we actually um, overlay the, the colors from the sensor about the final um, color patches of the camera. You can see that the color is still wrong. If you do not consider um, the sensor, you see that the color transformation is wrong as well. But if you apply both, then the colors are really consistent with uh, the real color patches. And additionally, we also um, have rendered a 3D scene here. So here are the virtual sheep from before. Uh, and this time the whole system is applied and you can see that the colors are matched up really nicely. Um, so in the middle, you see a real sheep and all the others are virtual. And the two images are two different lighting conditions. So the top one is basically indoor lighting and the bottom one is a lighting coming only from outside from the window. And you can see that the image signal processor, the ISP net, is able to um, match the color that is coming from the lighting condition. Now we also tested our system with um, for other objects. Um, for more information, please refer to the paper. Now final result of uh, our system. And uh, here I leave it up to you uh, to decide which of the tiger is actually the real and which is the virtual one. All right. Now there are some limitations of our network. Um, that is, uh, we do not consider all possible camera effects. For example, we don't consider chromatic aberration, motion blur, or vignetting. So chromatic aberration, for example, um, means that uh, the lens, uh, the uh, different wavelengths are refracted differently. That leads to some color bleeding around sharp edges. Um, this effect is usually mitigated in modern camera systems by the lens system itself. Um, then motion blur, so if you move the camera very quickly and have long exposure times, then you will uh, um, see some kind of directional blur effect. And uh, this effect, for example, can be applied if you track the camera using a SLAM system and um, apply a motion model and then uh, use that to apply a directional blur effect onto the final image. And vignetting means that the image is slightly darker at the corners of the image. That is because uh, there's not so much light coming in as in the camera sensor. Um, this effect can, for example, be applied by taking images of a uniform white background and then applying this as a post-process effect. Additionally, future work would consist of scene simulations. So we've already seen the two papers before me. Uh, this is a very important and uh, active topic. Um, so we also want to investigate in material estimation and also light source detection to improve um, the, so lower the, the error of the shading because that's also of course a uh, impact on the final result of the rendering. Okay, that was my talk. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, David. Are there any questions or comments from audience? Okay, so yeah, yeah, I really impressed the final result. Very nice. And uh, but uh, in this presentation, you estimate the less net sensor net and the IP ISP net according yes. to the real object in the captured image. So I'm curious about, is it possible to control the estimated network to create an arbitrary virtual camera? Um, so the camera is now trained with, with uh, so the network is now trained with a camera and then is able to estimate the parameters for this camera. So that means that uh, if you now want to apply a new camera, then you have to take images uh, with the camera and then uh, estimate those parameters for that camera. Okay. Yeah. So, but of course you could as well use this model on a different camera as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the question is, you know, uh, these parameters are often quite different for different camera systems. Um, we used a lot of these mobile uh, phones, phone cameras. So maybe you could apply that to another mm -hmm. phone because they are quite similar. Uh, but it's maybe not so not to working well with uh, like a um, you know a real camera. Then you have to take new images and can it train a network again and then it will work again. 
Yeah, although the result is very good, but sometimes we, we want to adjust a little bit more. So in, the, in, that, in that case, if it's possible to change the network a little bit more. Hmm. Uh, you, mean, you mean the... Uh, so yeah, the, um, if we want to change the final result a little bit more, a little bit more, so it's possible to control by uh, adjusting the network. Ah. So you mean, so for example, if you would change the exposure manually, um, mm -hmm. yes. something like that, yes, it's possible because we use uh, all those parameters as input uh, to the network. You can also change it basically virtually. So to um, simulate a blur effect, even though uh, you, you maybe don't have this kind of blur in your camera image. But if you, for example, just want to virtually blur something because you want to guide the attentions, for example, uh, you, you could, for example, um, uh, change the focus uh, distance to make it appear in focus, even though it isn't. Yeah. So it did, this would work, yes. Thank you. And uh, here is the question from the audience. Is it challenging to access all the required camera properties across devices? Um, yes. Uh, so it, it, it is quite challenging. Um, so we try to find out um, all the necessary parameters. Um, and often they are unknown, basically. Uh, so, so um, of course, things like, for example, a focus distance. Uh, or something like that, um, you can get from the metadata of the camera images. So often there's a lot of data there, but it's not everything uh, we need. Um, and yes, it's very challenging. That's why uh, we tried to estimate it using the images because that is something you can always do, right? Thank you very much. So are there, if there's no comment from the audience anymore, so. Let's move to the next presentation. David, thank you very much. Okay. Next paper is uh, Selective Forbated Ray Tracing for Head Mounted Displays. This is given by Yong Hong Kim, Yu Min Ko, and uh, In San Him. And the uh, presenter is Yong Hong Kim. Uh, he's a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Sangyong University in Seoul, Republic of Korea. His research interest includes real-time ray tracing and extended reality. So Yong-Yong, Yong if you're ready, please start your presentation. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Yong Kim from Song University in Korea. Now I would like to present my paper entitled Selective Poverty Ray Tracing for Head Mounting Displays and co-author with Yun Go and In Sung Im. Ray tracing is very useful for providing excellent immersive experience for VR AI users, but it is still regarded as computation version on head mounting displays because HMD demands high rendering rate and above all sufficient anti-aliasing efforts. So we need to use a carefully designed ray tracing technique for HMD systems. In this paper, we present a perceptional highly efficient pixel sampling technique, which aim to efficiently apply the ray tracing algorithm on HMD. Basically, our method improved the frequently used Hoyt rendering method using an adaptive super sampling technique called selective sampling. The presented hybrid sampling technique allows high sampling rate as effective as up to 36 samples per pixel around the central vision, gradually reduced to at least one sample per pixel in the almost peripheral vision. In developing our selective property ray tracing pipeline, we also propose some optimized technique, including temporal pixel reuse and four-bit temporal pixel smoothing. Before explaining the details, let me show a video clip which introduces our work.
In 2009, Gene and his colleagues proposed an adaptive selective supersampling technique for a high quality real time GPU retracing. This method offers high sampling rate as effective as 9 to 60 samples per pixel. The key in our work is how to cleverly combine the selective sampling technique with a 4-bit rendering scheme. The algorithm is made of three stages where the, where the first two collect the necessary information and determine where to shoot extra rays. Due to the limit time, I skip the detail on this algorithm. Please refer to their paper. As you well know, the Fobin rendering method has been frequently used to achieve computational efficiency by exploring the essential property of the human visual system. Particularly, the fact that visual acuity is maximum at the fixation and the fair off rapidly with increasing eccentricity. From now on, let me discuss the details on our selective property rate tracing algorithm. Our selective property sampling technique considers the full heated style ray tracing mechanism. Therefore, the result renderer can create optically collect shadow, reflection, and refraction on HMDs. This slide shows the four-stage hybrid ray tracing framework, which was implemented through the OpenGL and CUDA pipeline on the GPU. Let me explain the rendering pipeline step by step. The first step, gather both image and object space pixel attribute at their center through a preliminary ray tracing computation. But unlike the genes method, we apply a hybrid ray tracing method that utilizes both OpenGL and CUDA for efficiency. In the second step, our method carries out a pixel reusability test for each pixel in the central pixel region. It computes a pixel reusability map that indicate which pixel of the client frame may simply take pixel colors from the immediately proceed frame without tracing lane. All pixels that pass the pixel reusability test, their color are simply copied from those of the corresponding pixel in the previous frame without expensive ray tracing. Our method allow a user to control the degree of pixel reuse using a parameter named tau sub reuse. These two images show two different cases where the reuse pixel are marked in red. For the remaining pixel that fed the pixel reusability test, we perform the selective Fovea ray tracing computation. This stage is made of two sub-steps, sub pixel inspection and select Fovea much sampling. First, for each of the four sub-pixel pixel, a modified two-step disparate test is performed to see if extra sampling is necessary. In contrast to the original disparity test of genes method, we modified the final threshold value tau sub cell in the test to reflect the acuity of human vision in the forbid rendering of the central pixel. In our work, the adjustment function tau sub f of e, of e is defined by a pair of C1 continuous quadratic line, which can be easily controlled by a user through four control parameters. These two results of selective 48 supersampling indicate 
how intuitive the adjustment function control the ray sampling pattern. After the sub cell inspection is finished, extra rays are fired through each prob problematic subpixel area, accumulate the shading colors with the proper weight. In this process, the number of ray samples take per subpixel is preset forbiately in decreased manner around the four area in the central pixel region. This slide compares the result of our set forbid sampling to those of the selective only sampling of genes method. As you can see in these images, our method automatically decides where to shoot more ray, both forbiately and selectively. Therefore, sampling more only in the pixel with the detail even in the forbid region. Please note that our method fire by far fewer rate than genes method to produce professional superior rendering result. This slide shows another comparison. The final step in our rendering pipeline reduce temporal aliasing artifact by combining the render pixel color with those of proceed time frame in forbid fashion. For this, each pixel of a current frame is first back project onto a given number of immediate proceed frames. Then only the matching pixel color are blended with the current one using the exponential smoothing technique. It should be emphasized that this temporal anti-alias process is also carried out for it using a brand factor that changes as a function of the visual eccentricity. This rendering result shows more aggressive anti-aliasing is applied over increasing eccentricity to compensate for the decreasing sampling rate. We have tested our method on dual NVIDIA GPUs where the ray tracing was accelerated on the CUDA pipeline without the help of their ray tracing hardware. Our ray tracer is based on the KD tree structure and DUCE is currently not assigned to the dynamic scenes. This and next slides compare the different image of the rendering result of three ray tracers against the ground truth. The ground truth image in the leftmost column was rendered by a fitted style ray tracer, then used 36 satisfied samples per pixel. Then the other three columns show the result from three ray tracers that are based on the regular sampling with one sample per pixel, the selective super sampling by genes method, and finally, our selective Fourier super sampling respectively. As expected, our method was able to focus computational effort on the most important Fourier region for minimized visual artifact in the neighborhood of the fixation point while achieving high rendering speed. This table shows the statistic that reveal the quantitative behavior of the test ray tracer. Clearly, our selective foveate ray tracer was highly efficient in that it processed far fewer ray than the selective only ray tracer, leading to significant acceleration in the rendering computation. Nevertheless, the PSN value in the table strong indicate that our method provide rendering of a much better quality within the forbidden field of view, which is an essential requirement for effective forbidden rendering. To wrap up my talk, ray tracing with one sample per pixel is clearly unsuitable as a rendering method 
for HMD due to serious visual artifacts. To solve this problem, we propose an effective selective forbidden sugar sampling technique allowing an efficient fitted style ray tracing on commodity HMDs. One thing to note is that our plant ray tracer is long on the CUDA pipeline only. It would be interesting to see how the ray tracing hardware in the latest GPU can improve the ray tracing quality put on the head mounting display system. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So are there any question or comments from audience? Okay. Uh, in these days, we can walk around the environment with putting on a Hetman displays. So in such scenario, there will be motion blur. So do you have any idea to handle the issue? Uh... Uh, our method, many condition check. Mm. So if I move, uh, if I move, uh, our method also be used in dynamic scene. Mm. So yeah, yeah but uh, yeah. when the motion blur occurs, that the how to say that the edge information is lost by motion blur. So is there any problem uh, for your uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not good in English. Please use this code after this session. Then I will try to answer in detail. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. So is there any other comment? No. OK, so. Oh, thank you very much. So I, I'm we are going to move the last presentation of this session. The last talk is selective hobbyated rate. Ah, sorry, this is the first. The last presentation is hobbyated photon mapping given by Xu Hei Shi, Li Wang, Xiao Heng Wei, and Li Qi Yang. And the presenter is sorry, Xu Hei Shi. Uh, he's a PhD student in the School of Computer Science at Beijing University. His research interests include virtual reality and rendering. So, Juhei, if you're ready, please start your presentation. Uh, thanks for the introduction of the chair. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Xu Hui Shi from Beihang University, Beijing, China. Our paper is for the photon mapping. This work is together with Li Li Wang, Xiao Han Wei from Beihang University, and uh, with Lin Qian from University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, the motivation of our method is to render complex virtual scenes that contain various materials in real time and present them to users using VRHMDs. Photon mapping provides an efficient solution for rendering scenes with various materials. It can achieve high quality rendering effects, but the frame rate cannot meet the needs of VR users. Uh, for it, the rendering provides a further acceleration idea, idea for VR applications. Gante et al. in 2012 used the foreated graphics to generate a three layer image with different restorations using one restoration pipeline and the composited, composited them to generate random results. We at all in 2016 integrated ray tracing to the foreated rendering, but it, it is limited by the performance. Why at all in 2020 adapt the instant radiosity into foreated rendering, but it can only render diffuse scenes. There are also some researches focused on accelerating photon mapping. Tawara at all in 2002, Propose that an irradiance cache based method, it can only trace photons for dynamic part of the scene for each frame and compensate the rendering results of the static part and the dynamic part of the scene to accelerate the performance of photon mapping. And the Maguire et al. in 2009 proposed the image space photon mapping. It accelerates the initial bounce and final bounce of photon tracing with the advantages of rest relation. To adapt photon mapping to foreated rendering, two challenges need to be addressed. 
One is how to generate high density photons in the Fourier region to render high quality images. The other is how to improve the performance of time consuming photon tracing process with high density photons. We design a foreated rendering framework uh, for it the rendering framework for photon mapping to address the above challenges. The left shows the um, pipeline of our method. There are four main steps. Step one is light photon tracing. Step two is temporal photon management. Step three is for it the photon tracing. And the last step is rendering. The first step is light photon tracing. It traces photons from the Light sources by irradiant cache based method proposed in Toraro in 2002. Light photon tracing can be divided into static light photon tracing and dynamic light photon tracing. In static light photon tracing, the light photon PL1 is Im emitted into a scene from the light source and then bounce once of this, of this on the scene surface and generate a light photon PL2. In dynamic light photon tracing, we trace light photons for the dynamic objects in the scene for each frame. In the figure, when the ray hit a dynamic surface, it spawned two rays to continue photon tracing. The solid ray is regarded as a positive ray. It hit a sphere and generated a positive light photon, PL3. Then the con continue bounce, finally terminate in the surface of the wall and generate a um, positive light photon, PL5. The dotted ray is regarded as a negative ray. It pierces dynamic objects and to generate a negative light, of, uh, light photon, PO4 and a PO6. They both carry negative energy for the, um, they both then they are used to subtract energy from the static irradiant cache due to the occlusion of the dynamic objects. Then we perform temporal photon management to select valid for each photons. For each frame in the frame, for each pixel in the frame buffer, it has for each photon set in the top right figure. The for each photon PF1, PF2, and PF3 belong to the for each photon set of the of PX. Firstly, for each pixel in the Fourier region, we use back reprojection technique to get its previous projection pixel based on the single current frame buffer and the single previous frame buffer, such as PX1, PX2, PX3, and uh, their previous projection pixel, PX1 prime, PX2 prime, and PX3 prime. Since PX1, PX2, and their previous projection pixel, PX1 prime, PX2 prime, are on the surface of static scene and are diffuse. We keep the foreated photons in PX1 prime and PX2 prime's photon states, and then reuse these foreated photons for rendering the current frame. Since PX3 is on dynamic object surface, we discard the foreated photon in PX3 prime's foreated photon state. Then we perform foreated photon tracing to generate high density photons in the Fourier region. Here, we have the generated light photon of the current scene. We trace photons from the Fourier region in the image plane. In the figure, the blue lines show the foreated photon tracing paths. It first intersects the diffuse flow and generates a foreated photon PF1. The bounce direction of PF1 is, is set to reverse direction of, of the nearest light photon PL1, and then the continue bouncing. Finally, it terminates at the low. And surface of the wall and generate the foreted photon PF2. The flux of PF2 is set at the same as the nearest light photon PO2, and the flux of PF2 is transmitted to PF1. In the second foreted photon tracing pass, the, the bounce direction of PF3 is set to the reverse direction of the nearest light photon PO3. Then it continues bouncing, and, and the direction of the bounce according to it according to the refraction rule. Finally, it terminates at uh, um, PF4. And the flux of PF4 is set the same of the nearest light photon PO4. And the flux of PF4 transmitted to PF3. In the third for it photon tracing pass, the nearest light photon of PF5 carries negative um, flux. And then this for it photon tracing pass and the corresponding photo photons are discarded. The last step is rendering. We estimate the radiance of 
each pixel in the current frame buffer. For estimating radiance of the peripheral region pixel, we use the radiant estimation method of all night photons proposed in the radiant cache best method. In the figure, the green line visualizes the tracing, tracing ray passing through the center of the peripheral pixel, PX1. And the green dotted eclipse shows the gathering region for PX1. For rendering PX1, PO, PO7, PO8, and PO9 are gathered to estimate the radiance. In the Fourier region, we use Fourier photons and the light photons to estimate the radiance. In the figure, for rendering the pixel PX2 in the Fourier region, um, PO2 and PF2 are gathered to estimate the radiance. We multiply the energy normalized parameter eta by the radiance of all four-weighted photons and the light photons to get a radiance of the pixel in the Fourier region. And the energy normalized parameter is the ratio of the sum energy of the positive light photons to the sum energy of the four-weighted photons and the positive light photons. We compare our results with pass tracing and the photon mapping. Both our method and photon mapping use three million photons. The global effects of our method are close to pass chasing than that of PM3M. Uh, in the yellow rectangular region, we can see the closer effects on the fruit tree are too close in the result of PM3M. And in the green rectangular region, there are some noise points around the caustics in the result of PM3M. Here, we show the rendering results of our method in conveyor box and the room. In conveyor box, um, the caustic changes according to the water waves. MSC of our method is 3.7 times smaller than that of PM3M. Temporal MSC of our method is 1.41 times smaller than that of PM3M. In room, when a piece of transparent jelly falls on the table, the green caustics on the table are rendered in real time. MSC of our method in 2.95 times smaller than that of PM3M. Temporal MSC of our method is 1.43 times smaller than that of PM3M. This table shows the performance of our method and the speed up versus the photo mapping method. For all test scenes in HMD, the slowest rendering time of our method is 33.1 milliseconds per frame. The re reusing rate of photons in our method is between 71% and 83%. Compared with photon mapping method, that use the same photon number of our method, our method achieves 3.5 to 4.5 times speed up. Compared with the photon mapping method that had the comparable rendering quality in the Fourier region as our method, we achieve 9.1 to 12 times speed up. In conclusion, we propose the Fourier photon mapping method to render high quality global illumination in the Fourier region in real time on dynamic scenes with multi material surface. We propose a Fourier photon tracing method to distribute the high density photons in the Fourier region for rendering high quality global illumination. And we propose a temporal photon management algorithm to efficiently select valid photons and trace new photons for a kind of frame. There are also some limitations of our method. The first uh, limitation is that our method cannot efficiently rendering uh, virtual scenes with the dynamic of light source. And uh, the second limitation is the performance of temporal photon management will drop when there are too many dynamic objects in the scene. Uh, the third limitation is that our method only maintains high quality images in the Fourier region, make low some strong view features in the peripheral regions. In the future week work, the first possible one is to reuse the dynamic photons based on the idea of motion vector. The second one is to integrate the perceptual model into four-weighted photon mapping and generate high-density images in a wider view accurate range. And the third one is to extend the four-weighted photon mapping method to support large-scale volume data or translucent materials. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So, uh, is there any question or comment from the audience? Yeah, I think uh, the great is really, really great. Uh, the the generated results are very, very, very great. And uh, and um, maybe this is not directly related to this research, but I'm concerned about the artifact outside of the phobia region. So do you have any idea or solution for that? 
uh, in the future work of uh, in the future work, we we want to combine the contrast sensitivity functions and uh, some spatial view accuracy um, method to uh, foreted rendering and uh, combine the it with and combine them to foreted photo mapping to reduce the artifacts in the peripheral region. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you. So okay. So is there any other question or comment from the audience? No. So okay. We so let's uh, we want to leave the rest of the discussion to the open talk at Gaza Town. So uh, the, first of all, I would like to thank to all speaker and the audience to join this session. Thank you very much. And this is the final announcement for the audience. And uh, let's move to move into the gather town to discuss with the authors in QA track A track A rooms. And uh, yeah, and uh, for example, the room A1 is for the first talk in this track, and A2 for the second talk in this track. And uh, yeah, after the after this session, please follow Michelle, who is supporting this session, to be transport, transported, transported, transported to the room. So you can find the link in the uh, chat window, I think, right now. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's see in the gather time after this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.